Welcome back to our weekly Bible study. If you're new this week, we're studying the book of John this year. I don't have any announcements today. Last week, I had too many announcements. So let's dive into our passage today. Let's start off by going to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, you exist outside of time. We measure time by the movement of the planets and stars, which you, through your triune nature, created. You've always been and always will be. No one is like you. We're grateful that you are eternal because you are the only one who can give us eternal life. We give you this time to open our hearts and minds as we pray for you to illuminate our souls so we can see your glory through the pages of scripture. In Christ's powerful name, amen. As we get going, I'm going to open today with a story from one of my seminary professors. On his blog, he recently posted an interesting lunch encounter he had, and I wanted to share it with you guys. The professor went to a local restaurant to have lunch. He noticed the waitress had a lot of piercings. So he asked if all those piercings she had hurt. She said no and began to tell the professor about her piercings as well as a variety of colorful tattoos. He asked what one tattoo meant. And she said, hold on tight. She told him that it reminded her to hold on to what matters when life hurts. He asked <clears throat> what mattered to her and what did she hold on to? She said her family, her dog, and her friends. With that, he asked all of those things are temporal. And did she have anything that was transcendent to hold on to? She said, no. That opened the door to talk about God. She said she believed there was a God, but did not feel comfortable about religion. She also said she used to go to a, a Bible church, but did not like the hypocrisy and religious stuff. Then the professor told her to focus on Jesus. Essentially, hold on to Jesus. Hold, he told her it was okay to run from hypocrisy and religion, but reiterated she needs to hold on to Jesus. I imagine many of us have family, friends, and bump into people who are like the waitress in this story, who equate Jesus to a leader of religion with hypocritical followers. They're nice people who are suffering from an identity crisis. They don't know the identity of the biblical Jesus. As Christians, we need to tell those around us to hold on to Jesus but we also need to let them know who the biblical Jesus is. Well, <clears throat> the people in John's day were suffering from the same identity crisis. They didn't know the real Jesus. And so John opens his gospel account right away, laying the groundwork to help others understand who the biblical Jesus is. Our lesson today is divided into three divisions. Division one is John chapter one, verses one through five. The word is God. And our second division is John chapter one, verse, it's verse six through 11. The word rejected by the majority. And our last division is John chapter one, verses 12 through 18. The word received by the minority. As we head into our first division, the word is God. Please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1. Just a quick reminder, a BSF lecture is not a church sermon. It's not meant to dig out every nugget in the scripture. Remember, BSF is a fourfold approach. The lecture will skip over portions of the scripture to give space for you guys to have meaningful discussions in your group time. Also, because it's probably covered thoroughly in the BSF notes. So just a heads up, I don't want you to think, hey, Eric missed an important section of scripture. 
if that happens, it means you have the responsibility to discuss it in your groups and read about it in your notes. The BSF lecture is not designed to be an audio version of the BSF notes. John's gospel has the unique structure that it has two openings and two endings. This week is the first opening, which is verses 1 through 18, and is called the prologue. Next week, we will study verses 19 through 51, which is called the testimonium, and is the second opening. In John's prologue, he offers four reasons why to believe Jesus is God. Number one, the word is eternal. Number two, the word is the creator. Number three, the word is the source of life. And number four, the word reveals the father. Why is it important to get the identity of Jesus correct? Because your salvation depends upon it. And that is why John is so passionate about trying to help us understand who Jesus is. So we will believe. Let's go ahead and read verses one through two. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Why does John use the motif, the word for Jesus? He's the only biblical writer to use that imagery for Jesus. Why do you think he did it? Well, to the Hebrew, the usage of the imagery, the word, would take them back to Genesis 1, where the one who spoke creation into existence by using words. But in the first century, it was a Roman world where Hellenistic culture influenced all aspects of life and language. Bible scholars believe John wrote his gospel account in the city of ancient Ephesus, a Roman city with Greek culture. In Ephesus, many centuries before was ground zero for the usage and development of the imagery, the word, when referring to a divine being. Because of this fact, there are some Bible scholars who think John was overly influenced by the Hellenistic culture around him because of his usage of the motif, the word. However, the majority of Bible scholars take the stance that John was using the language of the Hellenist so that they may have a better understanding of the true identity of Jesus. At the time of John's gospel, Greek philosophies were deceiving many, and as a result was corrupting foundational Christian doctrine. So John chose to use common language of the day to preach the truth of Jesus. And that truth is, Jesus is fully God and fully man, the only one who can provide eternal life. Roughly in 500 AD in Ephesus, a nobleman named Heraclitus said, the universe operates according to a rational structure, a unified ordering principle, which can be discerned if we carefully observe its patterns and solve its riddles. The one ordering principle or force controlling the universe, Heraclitus called Logos, or in English, the word. Well, the Stoics and the Epicureans, Plato, they all adopted the usage to describe the indescribable force behind the operation of the universe. Well, when the Gnostics hit the scene, they too adopted this language. And in John's day, the Gnostics were either inadvertently or purposely trying to undermine foundational Christian beliefs. Now, there are two boogeymen in the New Testament, the Nicolaitans and the Gnostics. Next year, when we are in the book of Revelation, we'll talk more about the Nicolaitans. But for now, we're going to focus on John's battle with the Gnostics. So why are the Gnostic, why are Gnostic beliefs dangerous to the church? To answer that question, we need to dive into the strange world of Gnosticism. 
Now, this is not an exhaustive teaching on Gnosticism, but it's a high flyover, a simplistic view. Fundamentally, Gnostics pervert God's creation story, God's plan for salvation, the identity of Jesus, God's grace and mercy toward mankind, and God's future plan for humanity and earth. From a secular point of view, scholars are saying that Gnosticism is influencing wokeness, the trans movement, and Marxism in our culture today. So what does the Gnostic believe? Like I mentioned before, their version of the word is an impersonal force that resides in the Gnostic heaven called the Pleroma. In the Pleroma, the force is surrounded by 30 aeons that were not created by the force, but were emitted by the force. There are 15 couple pairs of aeons, a female and a male. The last aeon to come on the scene was named Sophia. Sophia wanted to create and be like the force. So she created the demiurge without the consent of the force and her male counterpart, Aeon. The demiurge created the earth and humanity, which earth and humanity are viewed as evil. The Demiurge rules over Earth with seven archons. The Demiurge locked up the first human parents, Adam and Eve, in prison, the Garden of Eden. But the serpent freed them by giving them hidden knowledge, which is called Gnosis. The Gnostics believe the Demiurge is cruel and unloving, and they believe the Demiurge is Yahweh of the Old Testament. Gnostics believe that the material world is evil and the human body is evil. And both are like a prison that need to be escaped so that they can commune with the force in the Pleroma. To escape, one must obtain secret or mystery knowledge. The ones who obtain this secret knowledge are the enlightened ones. It's unclear to me but either Sophia or the Demiurge gave the spark of God to all of humanity. Each spark of God must escape the created world to return to the Pleroma to be reabsorbed into the force. So the goal of the Gnostic is to actualize the deity that is inside of them. And they do this in various ways. Gnosticism comes from the word gnosis, which means the receiving a special or secret knowledge from the divine realm. The human who receives gnosis has the ability to release the God particle inside of them and obtain divine power. Some Gnostics say Jesus is the embodiment of the force who became incarnate to, br to bring gnosis to earth. But he wasn't true humanity because flesh is evil. So Jesus only appeared to be human during his earthly trip, but was divine. While other Gnostics say Jesus was a human who attained enlightenment through Gnosis and taught his disciples to do the same. Gnosticism is not a single movement or a branch of false religion. It's like the Hydra of false religion and worldly philosophies. Gnostic principles and beliefs extend deep throughout the world, throughout the world religions and world philosophies and have influenced many world leaders in our culture today. Now, after hearing about Aeon, Sophia, Archons and the Demiurge, you might be thinking, come on, Eric, no one believes this stuff anymore. I would like to say that is true, but it's not. Gnostic beliefs persist in our culture through the medium of entertainment, movies, songs, and books. Case in point, for those who might not know who John Lennon was, the guitarist and singer for the famous 60s musical group, The Beatles, John Lennon said, 
it seems to me that the only true Christians were the Gnostics who believed in self-knowledge, i.e. becoming Christ themselves, reaching the Christ within. The light is the truth. Turn on the light, all the better to see you with, my dear. Gnostic beliefs were invading the first century church with false teaching, and they continue to invade the church today. Gnosticism is a perverted theology that will take you down a dark path. Although they would tell you they are the enlightened ones, Gnosticism is dangerous to the church in the sense that it cloaks its, its beliefs in light. They have taken the Bible narrative and twisted it. They use biblical language, but have redefined it. So the new Christian or the Christian who doesn't know their Bible well can fall prey to the Gnostic beliefs. Now, there has been many Gnostic books written. The Gnostics had their own twist on the gospel. On the screen now is a list of Gnostic gospels. The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Truth, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of the Egyptians. Just by the titles, these books sound very Christian. And you might think, why aren't they in the Bible? I don't know if these books were written in a way to purposely deceive the reader on the identity of Jesus and God's plan of salvation, but that is the end result. Some other additional Gnostic books are Sophia of Jesus Christ, Pistis Sophia. Remember, Pistis is the Greek word for faith, and the hypostasis of the archons. Hypostasis comes from the word hypostatic, where we use hypostatic union when discussing Jesus's dual nature. So hypostasis of the archons is the nature of the archons. Remember, according to the Gnostic, there are seven archons that help the Demiurge to rule over Earth. I know all this sounds strange if you've never been exposed to Gnosticism, but John knew how dangerous Gnostic beliefs were to the early church. And in our modern age, Gnosticism hasn't gotten any safer. Moving on, for God to be God, he would have to be two things, eternal and not created. In the first two verses, John makes the case, the word is God because the word is eternal. In verse three, John makes the case, the word is God because he was not created, but is the creator God. Let's read verse three. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. There was an elder in the Alexandria church in the third century, a man named Eris, who taught the word was created by God. He was famous for saying there was a time when he was not. Eris' teaching was publicly condemned and he was removed from the church. However, this heretical view is still pervasive today. There are two American Christian cults that had changed verse 3 in John's prologue to suit their theological viewpoint that Jesus was created and not always eternal with God the Father. This has some serious theological challenges because, the tr because true deity is not created. Throughout the first five opening verses, John has been taking the reader back in time. In the first two verses, John took us, took us before time even began. And since verse three, John has moved us along the timeline to the creation. So let's read verses four and five as we wrap up division one. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Some symbols are so universal, so common to the human experience, they have the power to cross cultural boundaries. Artists and writers know these symbols as archetypes. 
For example, the color green symbolizes new growth or new life. Winter symbolizes death or hardship. Well, in the Bible, in the culture that John was living in, truth was often pictured as light. When someone gains wisdom, we say they've been enlightened or their minds have been illuminated. In the Genesis account, the Lord filled the formless and void earth with light, which happened on the first day of creation. But the Lord didn't create the sun or other lights until the fourth day. Light on the first day was literal light, but it was also the light of truth. The Lord infused every atom with his truth so that creation would reflect his character. The mind darkened by sin is also formless and void. It's the light of Jesus that will transform the darkened minds of humanity. Darkness is an archetype of the forces of evil. Although at times it feels like evil is winning, in the end it won't. Like Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 16, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Which brings us to our first principle, which is Jesus is fully God and shines his light into this world's darkness. Jesus is fully God and shines his light into this world of world's darkness. Who is the most qualified to tell you about God and things of heaven? Jesus was sent from the Father to accomplish God's plan of salvation and to reveal the Father and the kingdom of heaven. No human is capable of grasping God's infinite character because we are blighted in knowledge and finite in our capacities. This includes the worldly Greek philosophers. No one has an infinite knowledge of God. Consequently, Jesus being fully God and fully man is the most qualified person to explain heaven to us and not an outsider. This includes the angelic realm. Jesus is uniquely qualified to do so because he is God. So let me ask you, how might Jesus be trying to shine his light in your family's life this year? How might Jesus be trying to shine his light in your family's life this year? As we head into our second division, the word rejected by the majority. Please turn to verse six. As we read earlier, verse five is talking about the light that shines and is not overcome by darkness. And John picks it back up in verse 9 as he continues talking about the true light that came into the world. So how do verses 6 through 8 fit in? At first glance, it seems a bit disjointed or a fragmented thought, but it's not. John inserted these verses to inform the reader that the true light had a human witness. So let's read verses six through eight. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now, John is going to talk more about John the baptizer in next week's lesson. And so next week, we'll focus more on John the baptizer. This week, I'll just say a few things. First of all, he was sent by God. He was a witness to testify. He was not the light. And his purpose was so that all may believe. In John's gospel account, he uses the word witness 33 times, far more than the synoptic gospels. I think John's repeated usage of the word witness was to encourage the reader regarding the responsibility of every believer to be a witness for the light they have been given. The light, by coming into the world, enlightens all mankind. The universal implications of Jesus' coming are a theme in the gospel. 
all humans will have to decide about the validity of Jesus's claims. As humans, we can't enlighten men's minds, but we can witness to them and tell them the truth and leave the rest up to God. Now, God could have chosen many ways to witness to unbelieving man, but God chose to use flawed humans as witnesses and his revealed word in the Bible. Now, verse 15 is a parenthetical expression from John to give the reader more information. John's gospel is unique in the sense that John is the author, but at times he's also the commentator. There will be other times where he will insert additional information to help the reader understand. Let's read part of verse 15 and see why John added this statement. This is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now, those of you who are familiar with John the baptizer's birth knows he was born six months before Jesus was born. So how can John the baptizer say he was before me? John the baptizer was a witness for Jesus. He testified about the true light of Jesus. Also, John the apostle was showing that John also testified that Jesus was eternal. He existed before him. Even though Jesus called John the baptizer the greatest prophet, for the most part, his message of repentance and turn to Jesus was rejected. Just like most people reject Jesus, their creator God today. As we wrap up division two, let's read about this rejection in verses 10 and 11. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to, to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. These verses answers two questions. One being, if Jesus is God, why don't people believe in him? Well, people don't recognize Jesus as God, or they refuse to accept that he is God. Gentile unbelief wasn't from a lack of knowledge, but a lack of unwillingness. The Apostle Paul makes it clear that all people are without excuse because there is enough evidence in creation to lead them to God. Paul puts it this way in Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. The second question, if Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, why don't the Jews believe in Jesus? You see, the Jews believe in the coming of the Jewish Messiah, but they refused to receive Jesus as the coming one, the Messiah. Refuse can also mean embrace or believe. The Jews failed to embrace Jesus as their long-awaited Messiah. Think of it like this. <clears throat> Every modern home is connected to the electric grid, which supplies power to illuminate the lights in, in the home. But people can choose to never turn on the lights. The electric company doesn't force you to turn on your lights, but the power is available and the choice is the homeowners. However, John is telling us in this passage People chose to shun the light and pull down the shades and live in darkness. Which brings us to our second principle, which is most of humanity refuses the light Jesus came to bring. Most of humanity refuses the light Jesus came to bring. Division two highlights a national tragedy for the Jews and a worldwide epidemic of unbelief for humanity. The duty of humans is to be willing to accept the Father through the Son. Mankind is subject to God's righteous judgment because most people are unwilling to come to Jesus. It's not that they are not able. People have the ability to come to Jesus and that, and that we are capable 
of making choices. Jesus's gospel is available to all. Jesus welcomes anyone who believes in him. So let me ask you, where is God sending you to speak as a witness to Jesus's life and light? Where is God sending you to speak as a witness to Jesus's life and light? As we head into our last division today, the word received by the minority. Please turn to verse 12. In our modern day, naturalism or the religion of science has so influenced our culture that people have a difficult time accepting that Jesus is God. The people in the first century and a few centuries later didn't have a problem accepting Jesus as divine, but they had a hard time accepting him as a man. To them, earthly matter and human flesh was evil. So how could Jesus have a dual nature, God and man? This is a, this was a barrier for them, but not for everyone. You see, the Gnostics and their followers were troubled by Jesus's humanity. In fact, they were so triggered by it When they wrote their Gnostic Gospels, they wrote about stories of Jesus creating an illusion of being human. For example, when Jesus ate food, it was just an illusion. He never digested the food or relieved himself as humans do. You see, the Gnostics welcomed death as a liberation for the soul, an escape from the prison of the human body. They look forward to going up to the Pleroma, the Gnostic version of heaven, and communing with the divine mind, their wor- their version of the word. The Gnostic would have recoiled at the idea that God would have anything to do with the physical world. John's terminology would have been boldly offensive to the Gnostics. Thankfully, not everyone was deceived by Gnosticism. There were genuine believers responding to Jesus' message in faith. Let's read about these faithful people, starting in verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Well, on the other side of the story of rejection is receiving and believing. And in these verses, we bump into a truth for humanity. Mankind is condemned not for inability, but for unwillingness. God is our source of ability. Our duty to include all people is to desire the Lord. In this passage, John uses two words to describe man's desire for the Lord. And that is receive and believe. Let me ask you a question. Can you believe in the Gnostic Jesus and still be saved? John was challenging the influence of Gnosticism in the early church that had the wrong identity of Jesus. He did this because he knew you needed to believe in the biblical Jesus and not the Gnostic Jesus. Are you guys good with the dual nature of Christ? What we call the incarnation or the hypostatic union? Well, God became a man, flesh and blood and bone and everything else that makes up our human bodies. But but at the same time, he remained God, equal with God the Father. If this is troubling or difficult to wrap your mind around, Think of it like, think of, think of it in this way. Why did God have to become a man? Well, God loves us more than we know. He wanted to dwell with us and experience what we experience. He also wanted to reveal God the Father to us. But there is a fact about God. You can't kill God. He's eternal. So if God was going to die on a Roman cross, he would have to become a man first. So God the Son became a man with dual natures, fully God and fully man, so that he could provide the ultimate sacrifice to satisfy God's 
just wrath towards sinful man. The Bible doctrine this week is God the Son. And there's a great write-up in our BSF notes. And I would encourage you all to read your notes. But what happens when someone doesn't believe in, in God the Son? When people don't believe in Jesus and refuse to turn to him for salvation, they will bear their deserved punishment for sin. On a future day, they will face Jesus, not as Savior, but as judge. And in this life, they will live unsatisfied lives because Jesus created us in, in a way that only a relationship with him can fully satisfy us. But when a person believes that Jesus is God the Son and understands he loves us in the fullest possible way, and died to save us from our sin and death, we find purpose in this life and know that for all eternity, I will worship Jesus with countless others who have put their faith in him. Jesus changes the direction of our lives and defines the purpose of our existence. So let's read verse 14, which is the best verse in the Bible that describes the incarnation of Christ. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one, the only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. This verse describes that Jesus, God, the son became a tangible representation of God, the father in all his glory. John's usage of the word dwelling is interesting. In the BSF notes, it, it says the word can be translated as tabernacle, which means the sentence can simply say the word pinched, pitched his tent among us. We worship a God who desires to be near us, to have a relationship with us. Unlike the Gnostic divine force that is distant and unavailable and desires no relationship with earthly humanity, fleshy mankind, the phrase full of grace and truth can be rendered that Jesus is the perfect revelation of God the Father. John continues with the theme of grace and truth in verses 16 and 17. Let's read those verses. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In verse 16, John tells us that grace was added to grace. How are we to understand this phrase? In a sense, John might have been referring to the fact that God's provision of Jesus was added to or on top of the gracious provisions of the Old Testament. Now, some of you guys might be thinking, what are you talking about? Grace in the Old Testament? It was the age of the law. There were no grace provisions. We're living in the age of grace now. That's true, but the law was a shadow of grace. Jesus is grace consummated. While grace was part of the old covenant, it was superseded by the new covenant. John was not suggesting there is no grace under the law because there was Every animal sacrifice was an expression of God's grace toward the sinner, but they were a shadow of the ultimate sacrifice in Jesus. As we finish up tonight, let's read verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the father has made him known. Jesus came to reveal God the Father to us, which he is uniquely qualified to do because he's in the closest, because he's the closest to God the Father, which we're thankful because the Gnostic Father or divine mind or force is not accurate. We're so thankful and grateful that Jesus came to earth to dwell among us to die on a cross for us so that we can have eternal life. 
Which brings us to our third principle, which is <clears throat> Jesus gives eternal life to all who receive and believe in him. Jesus gives eternal life to all who receive and believe in him. Eternal life is an absolutely free gift through the one who came to us from the Father to reveal the Father to us. Eternal life is not obtained by a privileged lifestyle, secret knowledge, or human effort. Salvation <clears throat> is not free because Jesus purchased it for us. It's free because Jesus did all the work to accomplish our salvation. Salvation is not earned. We cannot impress the Father. The Father is impressed with Jesus, God the Son. So let me ask you, in what ways has the truth of Jesus led you to experience God's amazing grace recently? In what ways has the truth of Jesus led you to experience God's amazing grace recently? As we wrap up today, <clears throat> let me ask you guys a question. Have you ever wondered what God is like? When was the last time you spent time alone and stretched your mind to focus on what is God like? John answered that question today. He will continue to answer it through his gospel account. Jesus is God. He is the visible representation of the invisible God. Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. Jesus is the only source of eternal life and light. So if you want to know what God is like, hold on to Jesus. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we head off into our discussion groups, help us to treasure the wonder of Jesus and to treasure how our salvation impacts our present lives as well as our eternal lives. And help us to understand that Jesus is our source of strength for today and our certain hope for the future. In Christ's name, amen.